Good evening to all of you. Now we are already 41. Others will join in due course of time. So we start our, you know, session. And as I have already mentioned, Orissa Theological College, Orissa Christian Theological College group are joining with us, new group. And we're very happy that uh, they could be with us from today. To our today third module is church and prophetic witness in times of pandemic. Four speakers will speak today, to, four of, two of them, and then next time, next week, two more scholars will speak to us. Before we move on, I want to introduce our new book. You know, we are planning to publish five books out of this webinar. And then I'm very happy that the first volume is ready. Actually, we were supposed to release Please mute. Otherwise, uh, if you are too disturbing, then we may have to exit you. So please, if you are not muting, please don't talk. So this book, we will release next week. So I'm just giving you uh, 17 articles on this. And then uh, it is, yeah, because of the election and other things, it is delayed. But anyway, things are already ready. So friends, today, our moderator is Reverend Dr. Jackmi Marak. She is the module coordinator of Church in Prophetic Witness in Times of Pandemic. She is an associate professor of History of Christianity in Harding Theological College, Dora, Mekalaya, since 2001. She did her Doctor of Theology under the Senate of Serambo College University, and she has contributed many articles in Reviewed Journal. So we are very happy that Jagmi is here to moderate the session. I just want you to let you know that Serambo College is full of people, police people, you know, for the tomorrow election distribution. So you will see a lot of noise from my side. But uh, when others speak, I will mute myself. So now over to Jack Me. Yeah, okay, good evening, friends. And it is a privilege once again to be here. And then uh, uh, once again, welcome to this uh, program. Yeah, we have been uh, discussing about these uh, issues that related uh, with COVID-19 or pandemic from different perspectives. And even today we are privileged to look at what the church has been doing or what kind of a witness that we would be, the church would be giving as the people of God or as the Christians. So we have our friends, Mr. Brazil uh, to speak on the topic. Solidarity and mission in times of uh, pandemic. I, I will share. Okay. Uh, Brazil is. Yeah, this is. Brazil. Yeah, this is uh, Mr. Brazil Barrick uh, with us. He was. Uh, he has been working uh, with the youth at. Uh, Limbuguri Baptist Church in Tinsukia, Assam. And he is also a youth secretary. He was a youth secretary for two years and still involved with the activities of the youth in Tinsukia Association 
Assam. And now at present, he has been working as a mission since uh, under Assam Baptist Convention. And he would be uh, speaking on the topic solidarity and mission in times of pandemic. And we also have uh, Dr. Akani uh, Sumi. Dr. Akani uh, Sumi, he, she, uh, sorry for that. She is an associate professor for almost uh, 10 years uh, in the Department of Old Testament in uh, Eastern Theological College, Johar Assam. And she is also a Dean of Women's Studies uh, Study Center at ETC at Johar Assam. And she will be speaking on the topic Ecclesia in the context of COVID-19 from Old Testament perspective. So these two facilitators will be uh, speaking one after the other, which will be followed uh, so I'd like to give time for Mr. Brazil first, then Dr. Kanye will follow. Brazil, can you hear? Uh, yes, I can hear. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Once again, uh, good evening to one and all. I want to say thank you to the team who has been working this, the Northeast Christian University and all the team who have seen this vision to do something extraordinarily to work for the people and particularly in leadership empowerment training program. I want to say thank you to all of you. And if my slide is ready to be presented, I can directly go to uh, go and uh, present my slides. It can be shared. Yeah, I, I have opened already. Yeah, it's not visible. It's not uh, in the. Talkboard, please. Don't... You want me to share or what happened? Yeah, please share the PowerPoint. Yeah. Oh. Okay, can you see? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can see it. Yeah, then. I can see it. Uh, let me read out uh, as I have uh, noted down. The Northeast Christian University Leadership Empowerment Training Program, Module 3, and the topic is Solidarity in Mission. Uh, I would like to introduce in this way the world as a whole. Yeah, we can go with the next. The world as a whole during this pandemic in which the churches had been shut down, religious life was at stake, mission agencies were worried, community and ministry were in a lockdown, but prayer continues both in personal and communal because without God, nothing makes sense. And with God, we have everything we need. And every communal adoration before the throne of God, we pray for all impacted by the pandemic. We are also like Moses and Esther of the biblical times, interceding for our brothers and sisters all over the world. And only by watching the news channels, the television, from the very beginning of the pandemic, individuals, family, churches, organizations, have begun their mission work in solidarity 
with their own limit and capacity, which has been seen in the life of the church and the families. The next slide. I don't know if it's hang, no. I did not. I'm sorry, it is hang. Oh, let oh, me. Right. Not moving at all. Okay. Yeah. The first point, the first point which I have put is ecumenical and interfaith. Mission during pandemic is mostly ecumenical, where one doesn't bother about their denominational barrier and the faith that person belongs, but willingly ready to help in times of crisis, which we have been seen and also testified. To some of them can be classified. I have classified some of them, which can be seen in the next slide. It's just getting hanged, you know. All right, all right. Uh, I'm very sorry if it's uh, just getting hanged. All right. <coughs> Is it the one? Uh, the next, next one. Yeah, we, we, we can see here a picture. Yeah. Yeah, point number A under the ecumenical, uh, this one. Reaching out people of any other faith, where we can see a picture clearly depicts of how as, as the Christians, we are also giving relief to the people of other faith. Well, the next is the pandemic. The pandemic actually brought the humanness in each and every individual's life. The previous, the previous slide, please. Is it the one? Yeah, this is the one. The pandemic, particularly the pandemic, has brought uh, the humanness in every individual, individual's life. Without really caring about their faith practice, people provide services, which can be reflected from the Gospel of Matthew 20, 28, as it is said, Jesus as a son of man did not come to serve but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many. The secondly, it has been seen that people of all religion, caste, color, race, gender, has been rich during this pandemic, to which many Christian churches, churches, Christians, organizations played a Bible and every level. The next, The next is sowing our faith in collaboration. We can see a picture here, particularly when it's come to social work, social service, the Sikh community from India, they are always in the forefront. Nevertheless, even the Christian churches, 
are equal with the for mission work. The ecumenical body are strengthened during this pandemic. The entire mission come together and work for the common good and perfect example of unity in the body of Christ, which we have seen testified also in the news and also in the newspaper, we have seen that how different community, different believers coming and sowing, sowing, their, sowing the work, the mission, though they are from different faith. Next. Next, please. In the entire course of this pandemic, Saving human was important, is important. The COVID-19 is an historic global health and the pandemic seems inviable. Quarantine was a life-saving period of necessary isolations of a person with a highly similar to outbreaks. In order to control the COVID-19, the government began to build the isolation center which again falls shortage of quarantine facilities as a large number of people are returning to the states from various parts of the country. Next. And in this, the churches in the Christian majority states have offered their church hall to the state's government to be used for quarantine center. The total number of 168 churches from various denominations have come forward only in Mizoram and in Northeast India and India particularly and worldwide there will be many churches of all denominations, I believe, they have given their church, their halls, their uh, Mission centers for, for the quarantine center. Thus, the solidarity in mission can be seen even sharing their worship place for the sake of saving human. And that's why it's called saving human. During this COVID-19 pandemic, we have learned that saving human is the utmost important for which even Christ Jesus, he came himself so that we may get life. Point number three, ecumenical sharing of resources. Another concern that has come out from the moratorium calorie calls has been seen the introduction of the ecumenical sharing of resources, ESR. Following the Nairobi assembly in 1975, it began first as the study program. The WCC arranged the then koinonia sharing life in a world of community in El Escorial, Spain in October 1987. Next, please. It's yes, already done. Yeah, the next. Yeah. No, you have not read this one. Yes, in the context of changes that have been, that have touched upon the relationship between the sending mission organizations and churches in Africa and elsewhere, in the third world countries and also on ecumenical participation. The WCC played a significant role in fostering relationship in mission, sharing of personal and funds for mission, inter-church aid and development. Similarly to this, sharing of resources have also been seen during this pandemic. We have seen how the churches share the resources. And in point Y, point number A, I have put it, personal vehicle as ambulance. A pastor of Mizoram, a policeman in Manipur, and I believe many individual churches, family, share their own resources, like using a personal vehicle to carry sick people to hospital without any cost, which is also a mission in solidarity. Not only that, but in various ways they have given their mission work. Number B, repayment of debt. 
it has been noted that a person's debt was repaid by a stranger's anonymous person in this in the state of Mizoram. This is the this is the carrying mission, carrying mission sold in the life of the believers. These are all the outcome of this pandemic. Number number four, COVID Solidarity Fund. The world was facing an unprecedented challenges, changed with communities and economics, everywhere affected by the growing COVID-19 pandemic. The world is coming together to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, bringing gov governments, organizations from across industries and sectors and individuals together to help respond to this global outbreak. The outpouring of global solidarity and supports sparked by the shared challenges has been phenomenal. COVID uh, solidarity fund, how the government has taken initiative to work out together. In the meantime, both the state government have introduced the COVID response fund as care fund and care funds in in rest in most of the states. Individual families, churches, associations, conventions, and council have donated for the COVID care fund. The churches not only donate in case, but shown their solidarity even by constructing huge building for the attendance of pandemic as the outcome of the pandemic by an Al Baptist church in Nagaland. They have constructed a huge building for the attendants who will be staying. They have just built the building near the hospital so that the attendants can be taken care in that. This is also an outcome of the uh, mission in solidarity during this pandemic. The next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, my computer gets hang. I don't know. All right. I'm trying. Is it the one? Is it the one? Next, yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. Likewise, therefore, the COVID solidarity fund is not only in case, but in terms of kind, which also can testify among the Sikh community of Delhi. Sikh Gurudwara Management Committee constructed 100 bed uh, dialysis center at Gurudwara in Sarai Khali Khan is being told as, told as India's biggest dialysis center, which is an absolutely free. And these are all the outcome of the pandemic where everyone is doing mission and particularly the God's people. Next slide. Yes. During the COVID uh, pandemic, we are very much scared. People are scared. People have, uh, are not, uh, they are very uncertainty of their life and free distribution of face masks. So, and a, term, a type of mission work, though it's small, though it's very small, but they have done in a way, the churches have done in a way how to help one another. Next slide, please. The coronavirus or COVID-19 is a largely, large family of viruses that causes illness ranging from the common cold to acute res respiratory syndromes. But the current virus is a novel strain, not seen before. Common symptoms of the novel coronavirus strain include respiratory symptoms, such as fever, cough, and shortness of breathing. 
According to WHO, the WHO has declared the coronavirus epidemic as a global health emergency. Next, please. To protect people by giving awareness, churches has taken responsibility. Churches has taken the uh, done their mission to protect people by giving awareness among the public and giving the free, giving them free of face mask, hand wash, sanitizer, into which the churches of Northeast India and India at large have responded and provide free masks of sanitizer towards the community, which uh, there are a few pictures how people have distributed the grocery item, how people have distributed the mask uh, without the cost because the vulnerable communities, which uh, they cannot uh, get their food, they're particularly daily. So the churches have stood with them in providing their daily needs, masks, sanitizer, soap, and these are all mission in solidarity. Next, please. Support and relief. India has been locked down under lockdown since the 24th of March, 2020. To ease the humanitarian crisis caused by the spread of coronavirus has responded to the crisis. Reaching out to the most vulnerable community was the utmost important. Even here, the churches, families played important an important role in providing food and grocery as relief to the to as much as they can with their limited resources they have. The churches, the families have given out of what they have to the community, to the people who are vulnerable. Next, please. Religious and spiritual life. When we talked about the religious and spiritual life during the COVID-19, with the outbreak of COVID-19, all the religious places were shut down. Believers cannot gather in the churches to continue their faith practice. During the time, prayer is the only way to connect to the deity. And this time of distancing oneself from people and events gives an opportunity to focus more on the spiritual deity, deity that may be the most important aspect of one's life. Nevertheless, every crisis can be an opportunity if we know how to make use of it. I personally witnessed that during this lockdown, so many prayers were made with sincere heart. Home church was conducted to which every person can take part and attend. In the time of crisis, people draw much closer to God and surprisingly, huge amount of offering have been collected during the lockdown to send for a mission work. Some of the outcome of pandemic in our spiritual life can be classified as or discussed as in the next point, the next slide. Yes, number A, the family altar. When we talk about the family altar, during the lockdown, we cannot, we are not able to visit to the church. We are not able to have the corporate worship, the family altar. The family altar is the place where we instruct and build our faith, having fun together, sharing questions, teaching and encouraging each other to build one's person's and personal and spiritual life have the biblical significance like in Genesis, in the book of Genesis 1819, how God the Yahweh has instructed Abraham, for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for 
Abraham what he has promised him. During the pandemic, it has been noticed that people turn to God's family, God's family altar. Family altar is strengthened. A family fellowship become the house church. In doing so, family could unite and spend time together in mission, which is a core in family life in mission perspective. We see when many were staying outside, but this COVID-19 has brought us together. The second emergence is virtual worship, which is called our online worship, which we are doing at the, at the moment, the virtual uh, type of teaching and learning. In real life time and location of worship is determined. One should show up at the particular time at particular place, but the virtual worship, anyone could be anywhere with a connection and if it is recorded at any time at your convenience it is most important because so many young people have shown their interest and got connected to the local church after the lockdown lifted up in doing so the spiritual life of the people and particularly to the younger generation has been lifted up now the virtual worship has become a wonderful opportunity as well as platform to conduct worship online for those who are out in the cities for their for shaping their careers for education for jobs this is a wonderful opportunity to share gospel as well as to shape their spiritual life personal reflection and conclusion selling of possessions and giving away to the needy was the practice of apostolic time which is mentioned in Acts chapter 2, verse 20, 42 to 47. I'm not going to read out this. Uh, we know how the apostles has done during the apostolic period. They sell their possessions and give out to the, give out to the people for food, clothes, shelter, and in doing so, sharing is brought into the light, which is called humanitarian service, which is, which is mission we discovered in solidarity. The last slide. Next slide, please. The Christian community and the church played a key role. Now the previous, the Christian community and the churches played a key role in helping to reduce its spread by allowing church hall to make quarantine center, giving awareness, providing free masks, soap, sanitizer, donation, and relief to the poor, vulnerable, and needy. Churches have taken the crisis situation as an opportunity to share the love of God in word and deed by doing mission in solidarity with pandemic. To say it in another, other way, another way, this is an opportunity for church to carry out the integral mission to which God has called. The inseparable proclamation and demonstration of the gospel as seen in the life and the work of Jesus Christ. This time of fear and uncertainty is a prospect to emulate peace that surpasses understanding, which we have in Christ. As we all know that coronavirus is still active as a community of believers and church, we must continue to provide member care, mobilize church member to love their neighbor, pray for the end of the COVID-19, all over and all over do the mission work of serving and saving lives in the world. Now, as we are already experienced the lockdown, the COVID system, the protocol, I believe next in the next phase, when we will get, if we are happen to get locked down, we could do more in mission. These are a few of the references which, which I have used during this making of the 
presentation. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brazil. Now straight away, I'd like to give time to Dr. Kani. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Chakme Seishmara, for our moderator, for giving me this time. I hope my voice is audible enough. I will uh, straight away go to the presentation, so I will try to share my screen. If mine does not work, then I'll ask Dr. Wati to help me, but uh, let me try. Okay. Um. Look, it's not coming with me. Click on the share screen. Yeah, it. Click on, click on the share screen. Yeah, I'm sharing. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, is it coming now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you make the slideshow. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, as I've been mentioned at the beginning of the session, my topic is on Ecclesia in the context of COVID-19 from Old Testament perspective. And... Uh, Okay, so the COVID-19 pandemic has brought a distinctive global experience causing systems of work, education, business, and domestic lives to change its course, affecting nearly every aspect of people's life. And since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been uh, reports of several conflicting views and advices from scientific, medical, as well as religious uh, worldviews. And uh, among this, the one which we have heard most from among the Christians is that there are Christians who think COVID-19 is uh, being sent by the evil forces or it is a kind of a punishment sent by God for sin and disobedience. On the other hand, we also find that uh, many of our churches, religious leaders, and also the people of God are leading the way in finding new ways to serve, unite, and curtail the spread of the virus. And in such a situation as this, in which the Ecclesia finds itself today, the understanding of Ecclesia and its function, uh, particularly from the Old Testament perspective, needs to be reaffirmed because the Ecclesia has a key role to play in sanctioning right beliefs and positive conducts in times of COVID-19 crisis. And uh, here I have some pictures of, of the covid lockdown situation, the empty streets, and where we were supposed to stay at least two meters apart. Shops, everything were closed, schools were closed, and we now we have the new normal that is no mask, no entry everywhere. So these are some of the uh, pictures that we can also uh, picture at the same time we have also experienced during the lockdown. And uh, the next one, the first point I would like to uh, mention is the definition of ecclesia and uh, ecclesia the word ecclesia is a greek word which is defined as a called out or an assembly or congregation and uh, this term is from two greek words the verb kalio which means to call and the preposition ek which means out of and uh, so the noun ecclesia it etymologically depicts the idea of the called out ones. And if you look at the secular definition, according to uh, Miriam Webster, it, uh, the Ecclesia is defined as a political assembly of citizens of ancient Greek states, especially the periodic meeting of the Athenian citizens for conducting public business and for considering uh, all the affairs proposed by the council. 
And so ecclesia is seen as a political phenomena, an assembly of citizens, of full citizens, which was rooted or which is rooted in the Greek democracy. And so it is an assembly in which fundamentally all the political and judicial decisions were taken. And so here I have a picture depicting the Greek city states where they had the police and the Acropolis. And so the police was the fundamental political unit in ancient Greece and the Acropolis was the Agora or the marketplace or it was on a fortified hilltop where citizens they gather to discuss city government. And we have different types of government, monarchy, aristocracy, oligarchy, and democracy. And so the early ancient Greece, uh, they had the system of uh, democratic government. And so the Athenians built their democracy, which was ruled by people. And so it was the people uh, who gathered or who assembled for all the important political and also judicial decisions. Then under the definition of Ecclesia, if we look into the New Testament, here I've brought out some uh, definition from a New Testament perspective. Here we find that the New Testament term Ecclesia provides an important link between the Church of Jesus Christ and the Old Testament nation of Israel. And in common use, it, especially in the first century Roman world, Ecclesia connoted an assembly. Uh, here the citizens of a given community called together to tend to city affairs like that in ancient Greece, which we will find in Acts chapter 19 verses uh, 32, 39, and also 41. And here with what we find here is that the early Christians, they saw themselves as a people called together by the proclamation of the gospel for the purpose of belonging to God through Christ. And so the choice of Ecclesia as the designation of the Christian community suggests that the New Testament believers viewed the church as neither a building nor an organization, they were, but they were a people brought together by the Holy Spirit and they were a people bound to each other through Christ. And they were God's people standing in covenant with him, which we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. And here in the New Testament, we find the Old Testament ideas are elaborated and applied to the early church. The Ecclesia now in the New Testament is God's Israel, which we find in Galatians chapter 6, verse 16. The saints, which we find in Romans chapter 1, verse 7, and the chosen ones, which we find in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, and the elect race, the royal priesthood, a nation that belongs to God, which we find in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And uh, again, what we find here is the church as Ecclesia, people of God. The church as people of God. And so here uh, in my presentation, I'm taking Ecclesia as the people of God. And so the usual Greek word for church is Ecclesia. Hence, church means gathering, assembly, or called out ones. And in the Bible, the word uh, Ecclesia was used by Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where it says, and I will tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so here we find, what we find is, the church is not a specific place, but it is a people. The church is not just any people, but it is the people who have been redeemed or reconciled to God by the Holy Spirit because of Jesus Christ's perfect work on their behalf, his life, death, and resurrection. And so the church is made up of all those that God has saved. Uh, a noted Catholic theologian, Hans Kung, said that the church is always, and in all cases, the whole people of God, the whole ecclesia, the whole fellowship of the faithful. Thus, the church is constituted of God's people. They belong to him and he belongs to them. And it is connected with the Old Testament basis of Ecclesia. In the Old Testament, Israel is identified as God's people. And most importantly, what we find here is God cares for his people and protects them. And he keeps them as the apple of his eye, which we will find in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 10. And in turn... God who covenanted his people 
expects that they will be his people without reservation and without dividing their loyalty. And so the church is no ordinary collection of persons or people, rather because the church has been called out of the world by the preaching of the gospel in order to live in covenant, it is constituted by people with a special consciousness. Then next we go, uh, so here I put up a picture. The first one is a church building. This is one of the biggest uh, churches in Asia. And so what, what this symbolizes, why I'm bringing these three pictures is uh, we can see a big building, but this building itself is not a church. If it is empty without people, then it is not a church. But a church is an assembly of God's people. And so uh, that is why I try to uh, bring this picture. Then the next is Ecclesia in the Old Testament understanding. The translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, that is the Septuagint, chose the word uh, Ecclesia to render the Hebrew word Kahal. In other words, the word Ecclesia is the rendition of the uh, Hebrew word Kahal, and this was used to refer to Israel as the congregation or assembly of the Lord, which we find in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 1 and following, 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 8. And so here it is a designation of the occurrence of assembly. It denotes the actual meeting together of the people, particularly as a worshiping community. And for Israel, this divine initiative can have a double meaning. First, it is a high honor and a privilege. At the same time, it is a heavy responsibility and a commitment. So Israel becomes God's precious possession and inheritance, who, who, who are called as holy or separate from the other nations, and who have received God's law, and God dwells with his people, and God promises his divine blessings. But at the same time, we also find that God's blessings and faithfulness require that Israel respond in faith and obedience. And so despite the fact that the election is the result of a divine initiative and is rather a corporate concept, Israel is a passive recipient of God's decision. But each Israelite and the people of God as a community are perceived as active participants in a dialogic relationship with God. And so uh, the people of God, the Israelites, they consciously chose God as their partner in a mutually binding covenant. And this willful acceptance of God's calling demands righteousness, royalty to God, slow and separation from the other nations. And uh, in the context of the Old Testament, the assembly of Israel was a people of God's own possession. God claimed his people through the covenant at Mount Sinai and also the uh, and thereby the use of the term Ecclesia in the New Testament looks back on that event. And the next point is Ecclesia as Kahal in the Old Testament. Of course, there is other word, Eda, which is also translated as congregation. But here I'm just using the term Kahal. And so Kahal uh, is translated, usually translated as an assembly, convocation, or a congregation and a company, which we will find uh, in Genesis chapter 28, verse 3, and also uh, in Genesis chapter 35, verse 11, Genesis chapter 48, verse 4, and Exodus chapter 12, verse 6 and also in Deuteronomy chapter 4, 10 and uh, Joshua 8 and also in the book of Judges chapter 20. And uh, even in the book of Leviticus, Leviticus uh, chapter 23, in Leviticus chapter 23, we will find the detail of the annual round of assemblies which were given to Israel and where the people of Israel, they had to assemble or they had to uh, gather as a community. And uh, then later, the continuing importance of the community gathering is indicated by the emergence of the synagogue, mostly during the Babylonian exile. And so here, Ecclesia does not refer to abstract entities like a society, but uh, it, is, it refers to actual gatherings of people. Of particular uh, significances are those instances of Ecclesia, which denote the assembly of Israel to hear the word of God on Mount Sinai and also on uh, later on Mount Zion. And uh, here we will find that sometimes 
the whole nation appeared to be involved, like when Moses addressed the people prior to their entry into the promised land. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 10 describes the day when you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, when he said to me, assemble the people before me to hear my words. And again, another example is uh, of the assembly of people at Solomon's dedication of the temple of Jerusalem. And so here, there are two pictures. The first one is uh, the picture that depicts the assembly or the gathering of the people of Israel to worship God and also to discuss matters. And at the same time, um, when they, uh, they gather to receive the divine revelation from, uh, from their leader or from, uh, or from the man of God, for example, like Moses and others. Then the second picture is about, uh, this is the temple, the Solomon's temple where people uh, gathered, especially this is during the time of the dedication of the temple, uh, temple at Jerusalem. Then the next point is Ecclesia as the people of God, particularly in the Old Testament. And uh, Ecclesia as the people of God, the people of God uh, here begins with the Abraham narratives, the call of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. God chose Abraham to receive his special blessing and to be a blessing to all peoples on earth. And the basis of relationship was, was God's sovereign and gracious choice of Abraham expressed in a binding covenant, which we will find in Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 to 14. So here, God became Abraham's God, and uh, a God who will provide protection and a fruitful future. And in turn, Abraham was to keep the requisites of the covenant and walk before God rightly. And so uh, this covenant embraced subsequent generations of Israel, and God's gracious initiative remained the basic element in their constitution as a people. And Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse uh, 7 to 8, affirmed that it was not because you were more numerous than any other people that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. It, it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors. Therefore, the obligation of the people of God was to love and obey God avoiding any disloyalty. And so um, here, the Ecclesia as people of God traces its roots back to this Old Testament concept of the people of God. And so in some, while the Ecclesia is defined differently by varied um, Christian and secular audiences, in all contexts, the term implies community obligation and contributing to the common well-being. So the idea of coming together to seek the common good is the core theme found within both historical Greek and the biblical usage of the term Ecclesia. Similarly, the etymology of the term Ecclesia further contributes to the idea that the Ecclesia requires a response as it denotes a group of people who must respond to an invitation to come together. The next point is on sickness or pandemic in the Old Testament. While the term pandemic is a modern term and uh, it was not used in the Old Testament, however, ancient Hebrew words such as dever, nega, and maka, those are the words which were used for diseases or pestilence and plagues in the Old Testament. While not every use of these words in the Old Testament refers to a terrible or infectious disease, many of the references do. So throughout the Old Testament, we see prophecies and repeated examples of God using dreadful infectious diseases to accomplish his divine and sovereign purpose. And so um, the Old Testament offers a view of the origin of sickness and also of the means of healing. And um, in the Old Testament, a strong and a direct link between sickness and uh, suffering of different nature is seen with the personal and also the uh, national sin. And it is the transgression of the covenant law. And uh, so the first fear we find is that according to the Old Testament, sickness and suffering are the result of transgression of the covenant law, which we find in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 20 to 21. And uh, 
The Judeo-Christian view regarding sickness is derived in part from Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 to 17, where we uh, find about the tree of knowledge. And so uh, here we find that God warned Adam that if he ate from the tree of knowledge, he would surely die. But both Eve and Adam, they disobeyed God, they sinned, and they were condemned to die. So it is therefore inferred that because of their sin and sickness, uh, <clears throat> sin that sickness, disease, and suffering became a reality in the world. And uh, there are also many instances in the Old Testament when sickness, disease, and that were meted out as a punishment by God because of his displeasure with certain individuals, communities, states, and nations for whatever reason he determined. Uh, however, we also find that sickness is not regarded as a curse which automatically follows wrongdoing. To a large extent, the way in which the Old Testament has built on this uh, theological perception is that God uses pestilence and plagues, sickness to judge, yet it is noted that God also uses them to warn and test uh, and shake people and nations to get their attention and to draw them to a right and healthy and joyful relationship with him. And so indeed, God in his loving kindness promised to be gracious, to forgive and heal the people of Israel if they were stricken with terrible diseases and then repented of their sin. And so uh, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 12 to 14 said, it says like this, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command, the locust to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. If my people who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and lead and heal their land. And so this leads to the idea that sickness is an occasion to seek the Lord. And here I have brought an example of two kings of Israel, Asa and Hezekiah. If you read 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 12, it says, in the 13th, uh, 39th year of his reign, Asa was diseased, uh, was diseased in his uh, feet, and his disease became severe. Yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but sought help from physicians. Then uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 24, it says, While in those days Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death, he prayed to the Lord and he answered him and gave him a sign. And uh, so here the chronicler's point is not to criticize the work of physicians, but to stress the fundamental uh, need to seek the Lord in sickness. Then in the Old Testament, when it comes to healing, in the Old Testament, healing is a holistic experience. In most instances, the healer metaphor is conveyed by the word Rafa. And uh, the word Rafa is translated, oh, it means to heal, to restore, or to make whole, to repair, or to mend. And so when we say healing or Rafa, it is the re restoration of all uh, relationships, the restoration of the Hebrew shalom. That is uh, here, it means to be restored to health is to be saved, not only from the pain and potential death, but from all other resulting trials. And so to be healed is to be saved in the full sense of the word. It could be primarily physical or social or national or uh, cosmic or any uh, illness or disasters. But again, another idea here, it is when we say shalom, it is to experience a normal relationship with Yahweh and also with our fellow human beings. And so a key term in the Old Testament, uh, Old Testament experience, uh, which expresses life and well-being is shalom. And, when we, and so when we say healing, it is a holistic experience. It is the experience of shalom. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse uh, 15, it, here it speaks of God's intent to protect his people from sickness. 
and uh, it's given there on the slide. I will not read out to save time. Then again, another example that I'm bringing is from Psalm number 38. Here, um, Psalm number 38 throws light to new life and meaning as one reads it from the perspective of somebody infected by virus, deadly virus like coronavirus. And in verse two, the psalmist directly addresses Yahweh with the cry to be spared from his suffering, which is described in the following verses, verses four to eight. The psalmist acknowledges that what he is, what he experienced or what he's experiencing is Yahweh's wrath and fury aimed at correcting him, which we will find in verse three. And the expression used show that there is a strong emotional aspect to his suffering. The vivid description of his physical condition shows striking uh, resemblances with a person suffering from a dreadful disease. Over and above, what we find here is the psalmist experiences rejection and even gossip by his closest relatives. Verse 11, it says, my friends and companions stand aloof from my affliction and my neighbors stand far off. And so, uh, which, is, uh, which is also a common experiences of, uh, experience of uh, coronavirus uh, positive persons. And so isolation and the fear to speak out on uh, one's condition also adds to the suffering of that infected person. And here we find that this psalm is an emotional but intimate wrestling with personal distress and also with God and other fellow human beings. However, towards the end, we will find that Yahweh himself is the ultimate hope as expressed in the appeals in which we find in verses verse 15 and also in verse 12. And so the message of this psalm number 38 is that the person in utter distress, a person may be in utter distress, pain and isolation now, but later on, that person will experience the acceptance and salvation from Yahweh. And so uh, that is in brief about the uh, sickness or pandemic, which, and also about healing in the Old Testament. And uh, the next point is implications for Ecclesia in the context of uh, COVID-19. Implications for Ecclesia. In, uh, in the context of COVID-19. And here, um, I would like to just mention a few of personal experience as well as not just personal experience, but personal uh, based on personal observations and, and from the things that uh, I have heard. And the first one is personal. During the time of lockdown last year, I had some uh, health issues. So I was on medication and uh, the most fear, uh, the thing which I feared most during the, that time was uh, if my health deteriorates and if I had to go to the hospital and uh, plus because I was taking treatment from Guati, so if I cannot go, what will happen to me? So uh, I had that experience and that made, to, made me to also uh, uh, reflect and think about people who are physically ill or those who are uh, suffering in pain or have some kind of other sickness the fear that they had or the, the family members of those people that they had. And so that was one uh, experience. And at the same time, uh, I have given a picture here of people going for shopping to buy uh, essential things like vegetables and also other essential things. We were also uh, in this uh, situation where we could not go anywhere and we had to wait for a time when we hear that it's open and we had to go. And uh, it happened I because of my health, I was not going anywhere. But one time, uh, just nearby our college at the gate, uh, we heard that uh, the vegetable vendors are uh, selling vegetables. So me and my husband, we went. And there we met one auntie, our neighbor. And so we were talking to her. And just uh, we came back and after one or two days, we heard the news uh, that uh, when this uh, Nizamuddin incident happened and people uh, related to those things, they printed out or they were, I don't know, uh, in social media, they were sending names of those uh, people related to that uh, event. And so I saw the name of that auntie whom we met and I was talking to her. And, and so we were in such uh, fear that if anything happens to her, then we will also be called or this and that. And so, uh, so many things uh, went through our mind. 
And so that is how we experience even uh, meeting people. And at the same time, again, uh, when it comes to Ecclesia or the church, uh, in the first presentation, Mr. Barik has also mentioned about how the church did uh, relief works or solidarity uh, works during the time of pandemic. And we have also heard about our own uh, churches doing uh, charity work or reaching out to the people, helping those who were in need. And uh, one thing that I heard is uh, from my church, from my home uh, church in Dimapur, they were also doing some relief work. But uh, what met, I may sound very a bit critical in this, but uh, I heard that they were uh, collecting money from some of the church members to do that relief work. And so that made me to question the church because our church is a very big church and it is a very rich church. They have a very uh, big budget. And so I was thinking, why couldn't they, uh, because they have enough money for their mission, uh, set aside for the mission so why could they take out from that what why do they have to uh, collect from other church members to do uh, relief work to others in the name of the church and so that was a uh, that is one observation that i would like to mention then again another uh, thing which happened in our church was uh, unfortunately some of our church uh, church staff our pastors they uh, were tested positive and after that not only from our church members, but even from the neighboring uh, churches, people from other places, everyone started questioning our church. Maybe members of that church or the pastors of their church, they might have done something wrong. And so uh, the question of uh, retribution or uh, because it is a punishment of God. So uh, what the people in the Old Testament have um, experienced when a person was sick or if any calamity or plague happened then they would say that it is from god as a punishment so even in our present context what i have personally uh, observed and experienced is that when people were infected or tested positive then people started thinking out their uh, sin or their the wrong being saying that they might have uh, committed some sin and so those are some of the personal um, observations and also experiences that I like to mention. And in line with that, uh, some of the implications for Ecclesia in the context of COVID-19, I would like to bring out is, uh, as I have said, during the times of crisis, panic, suffering, many people ask the question, why? There must be a reason why God has allowed this sickness. And so uh, we will find that the question of why does a loving God allow suffering remains the toughest uh, question across all time and context. Uh, however, as we reflect on our present pandemic situation, we are also reminded that the people of God in the Old Testament have been there before and they found their faithful uh, God faithful. And they have come through times when they were disciplined by God for unfaithfulness and found redemption in his mercy. Uh, but most encouraging is that throughout the history, God's people have found a way to be faithful, to be prophetic, and also uh, imaginative as they discovered fresh ways to align their lives, even in moments of sickness, plagues, and uh, national disasters. And uh, so, Maybe even the pandemic or the COVID-19 pandemic must be a time of disciplining by God for the unfaithfulness of the people. However, we also find the redemption in God's mercy and that the people of God, the Ecclesia has to be faithful, has to be prophetic and has to be imaginative and has to think about new and fresh ways of expressing faithfulness uh, to the living God and as well as uh, to share or to uh, express faithfulness and love to our neighbors. And so as uh, people of God should witness during this pandemic by uh, speaking and also the living uh, lives of hope and love to other people. And uh, here I want to bring out two challenges. The first one relates to stigma and discrimination. In the course of COVID-19 pandemic, stigmatization, especially uh, against those infected by the virus have been extensive. And uh, stigma can cause harm to individuals as well as cause other consequences. However, what we find here is that in the Old Testament, the harsh treatment and also the conditions that the people of God, they endured during the powerful regime, which reduced them 
to servitude and also which uh, made them to seek, uh, which destroyed their human dignity. Here we find that in the experience of the people of God in the Old Testament, the God in those times when people, uh, people's dig dignity, they were reduced. We find God who restored their dignity and a God who called these people of God to extend human dignity and welcome to those who found themselves in similar conditions. And so uh, unlike the other surrounding nations, Israel was to express an alternative story concerning the issues of security and acceptance. They were to speak of the welcoming and accepting God in a way that the entire world could hear. And this is also a challenge for us today, that we are to speak of the welcoming and accepting God in a way that the others could uh, hear. And the second challenge is about a development of a more sustainable response. As the people of God, we have an opportunity to imagine and to create a new way in which citizens uh, take part in public dialogues and also inhabit public spaces with other groups of people for the common good of everyone. And we as Ecclesia are called to seek the welfare of our communities in a society filled with the hate speech and social media contempt in which religion, race, gender, sexuality, and politics have become dividing lines of exclusion in which the church is equally at fault. If not a more uh, culpable participant, we need to find a we need to find ways of being human together. And this pandemic situation may just be the time for that uh, to happen. And um, another concern in, in this uh, time is the loss people of God are facing is the loss of practice. And so uh, when I say people of God is including all of us. And so we, are, we no longer understand what it means to practice our faith. And uh, ironically, uh, we Christians, we tend to get reduced to being nice or not bothering about others and not taking the faith too seriously or we don't want we say we don't want to cause a sin but how we respond in this uh, moment will shape what our faith will look like in this new normal world and it is time to put faith into practice and so <clears throat> the idea behind the word practice is that we are to engage in applying what we believe and what we have learned from the word of God or from our uh, God in real life situations. And uh, so in conclusion, I would like to sum by saying that uh, by uh, reaffirming that the term Ecclesia denotes people of God who are in a covenantal relationship with God and who are to respond in faith and participate actively towards attaining the wholeness of life, the Old Testament, Shalom. And God's people throughout history often found themselves in times and places that were intimidating to their faith, sickness and suffering were regarded as judgment and punishment by God. However, suffering of diverse nature was not simply punishment by a wrathful God, rather it was considered as the correcting and chastening reaction of the merciful and caring God. And so the people of God survived moments within history when they were plagued by worse diseases and despite the chaotic movement, a moment for a moment for God's people. God led them to find a way to faithfulness in dangerous and unfamiliar situations. And so the people of God lived and told a story that raised its hope on the sovereign and saving God. And we as a people of God now are also to reflect that uh, hope to people around us. And so um, I've, at the end, I have put up some um, pictures which convey the message of reaching out to others. And also uh, it says, when we reach out to others in love, we extend the hand of God. And reaching out to others in love matters to God. And uh, so uh, in the end, we, uh, at the end, we also have the message of hope in the midst of COVID-19, which the Ecclesia can bring to the people around the world today. I would like to thank uh, Neku and also uh, Dr. Wati Longchar for organizing this web, uh, webinar and also uh, giving me the opportunity and privilege to be a part of this uh, webinar. And I also thank uh, Dr. Chakmiya Marak. Through her, I'm able to uh, participate in this uh, leadership training program. So thank you so much.
Now, it, thank you, Dr. Kani and Mr. Brezner. Now it is a time for the discussions and for the discussions, uh, we can go to the chat and find out the questions that has been raised by the, um, by our friends. So certain questions have been raised. Number one, um, by Peter to Dr. Akani. You can read out because some of some are only in the telephone, you know. So yeah, you will not be. Able I'm to trying read. to read the questions from the chat, but yeah, if you can read out, then I think that will be better. Yeah, Chuck, we can read because some are in the telephone only, so you will not be able to see. I'm all searching again. Yes. Um, okay, I read out. If you are looking for that, I think this address to Brazil, we know the COVID-19 has greatly impacted lifestyle of various group. If this continue another two or three years, will this lead to severe consequences in bringing up bringing the next generation because of the different lifestyle and approaches to living standard in times of pandemic? So according to you, what is your view regarding the upbringing, the next generation, that is younger group? Thank you, sir, for the question. I hope I'm audible enough. Yes. Yeah, raising, raising children in this generation and particularly in the time of crisis, in times of technology is very much difficult. But if we go back to the Bible, the rules of our belief, our practice, I believe if we raise our child as it is written in Proverbs, it will be more meaningful. If we raise our children like in Christ likeness, I believe that in the times to come, our children, our generation, the younger generation will accept more the life of Christ. All of us will be surprisingly, will be surprised and it's very difficult to believe that the young people were away from the church for a few years, maybe 10 years, back then now. But after this COVID-19 lockdown situations, it has been seen in many churches, the young people are taking leadership. They have been given so many in charges. I believe if we raise the children in Christ likeness, they will have the same attitude of serving, loving, caring in the days to come. So that will be my personal response. Raise your children in Christ likeness. Thank you. Your Chakmi, next. In line with that, I think uh, Dr. Akani can respond to the questions of uh, Dr. Wati. That is, uh, today the church is institutionalized. And then um, Dr. Wati was asking. Uh, The church is governed by a few people. The presence of the people of God is losing. Many young people are not interested in church. What is your opinion as OG professor to recapture the true essence of the church today? That is uh, the questions to Dr. Kani. Thank you, Dr. Kani. Uh, 
from Dr. Wati Longcha. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Wati's uh, question and also of course, uh, Dr. Dimala's questions, somehow they are related. So I will try to uh, answer by clubbing these two questions together. And yes, I agree with both of you that uh, today, uh, I would also say that Ecclesia as a people of God is uh, not happening much in today's church. And yes, the church today is hierarchical, rigid, patriarchal, and exclusive. And that is why I also mentioned earlier in my uh, personal experience uh, says that I, at times, of course, we appreciate the church of what they are doing, but at the same time, even me personally, sometimes I tend to be uh, critical of what the church is doing and how the church is functioning. And uh, so uh, I would also say that uh, as Dr. Wati has mentioned, the church now is governed by a few people, uh, especially few old men. And even if we look at our churches, even uh, my own local church, I can see that uh, most of the decisions, important decisions are not taken by the pastor or the pastors under him, but it is the deacon board member members who are deacons who are very strong and they take almost uh, major decisions. But if we look at the concept of Ecclesia or the people of God, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and of course, even in the Greek and Roman context, we find that Ecclesia is the assembly of people or the, it is uh, it comprises of all people of God who are to participate equally. And so uh, in that area, I also agree that uh, the church is failing to be uh, the Ecclesia as the people of God as they ought to do and so uh, the church also has to really uh, as i have uh, mentioned also the uh, recovery of the practices of our faith and uh, the recovering is a way of uh, recovering a way of pra practicing our faith in both public and also uh, private as well as individually and collectively and one when that happens I, in the church in the ecclesia you know, for all the people of god then the same uh, preserving also the sustaining and the life-giving effect which we can find in the life of the Israelites in the people of God as well as in the New Testament can also uh, be again restored or recovered even in our present context and so that is how we can also recapture the true essence of the church today. Uh, of course there will be so many uh, ways and means but uh, just uh, just based from my presentation, uh, especially when we look at the uh, definition or the concept of Ecclesia and relating it to today's church, we uh, I would again say that yes, the church is institutionalized and that uh, the original, I would say the original concept of the people of God is uh, somehow losing its uh, touch in our church today. Okay, thank you. Another question is uh, from Indy Martin to Dr. Kani. Uh, if Jesus said, I will build my church, it means there was no church, Jesus' church before him. As he talks about future, so how can I know that there was church before Christ? Because some people believe there was church in Old Testament, and some people believe church was uh, born only on the day of Pentecost. Can you just uh, go on with this again? Okay, uh, okay, thank you. Um, here, the idea of church, as I've also mentioned earlier, the idea of church is not the structure of the building. And of course, many of the people will, uh, think and believe that when we say church, it's the gathering of the people between the four walls of a building. However, here in this, uh, even in Matthew, when Jesus talks about a church, it is uh, explained in such a way that the church, not as a uh, as people gathering in a room or in one place, it can be in an open place. And especially in the Old Testament, we will find that most of the assembly or the gathering of the people took place in an open place, maybe in a, in a hilltop, on a hilltop or uh, on a, at the city gates 
during those times they had city gates and in the old testament times and also uh, where they will have a big tree and under that a leader will sit a rabbi will sit and people will come and so here the understanding of the church is not the building but uh, the people of god the people the assembly of the people of god or uh, in Old Testament time, uh, terms, I would say the called out people. So in that sense, uh, in that sense, I can say that uh, the existence of the church, or I, I would say Ecclesia existed even uh, before the Pentecost, or especially it was there even during the time of uh, the Old Testament uh, times. Now coming to another um, questions from uh, Dr. Limala. Do you think Ecclesia as people of God is happening today in the church? Today, the church is uh, hierarchical, rigid, patriarchal, and exclusive. Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza, definition of Ecclesia as democratic assembly of equal needs to integrate in the definition. Oh, yes. she, she already answered. Yeah, but okay. uh, yeah, of course, uh, Fioranza's definition of Ecclesia as democratic assembly, that, uh, yes, of course, I will uh, add that one. But in the uh, beginning of the definition of uh, Ecclesia, I also mentioned a little bit about the democratic assembly, the Ecclesia as a democratic assembly. But yes, definitely, I will uh, add uh, Fioranza's definition of Ecclesia. Okay. Then the others are I hope we have uh, covered others are just the comments and then the is it um uh, from Mr. Caleb, then is different from between ecclesia and denomination. If we go down, we will see from Caleb, is there a difference between the ecclesia and denomination? Thank you. Uh, here in my presentation, I'm not bringing a difference between, uh, I'm not trying to dif uh, differentiate between Ecclesia and denomination, but I'm talking about Ecclesia as the whole people of God. It may be uh, uh, people may be belonging to any denomination, but the people of God as a whole. And so, uh, especially for me, I'm not uh, differentiating between Ecclesia and denomination. Okay, then let's go up a little bit to Alamla Longkumar uh, to answer, maybe both the presenters can answer this. The two presentations have pointed out that pandemic times, time, uh, times if sickness, difficult times was an opportunity to get closer to God. If so, how have we been faring in our spiritual journey? Is it that only when we are faced or challenged by such uh, such situations as today that the faithfuls become more sincere in their worshiping. Maybe Dr. Akhani, you can respond first, then by Brazil. Okay, uh, thank you once again. And uh, yes, uh, the last, uh, I like the last sentence is interesting and of course uh, there is a there is truth in that because uh, many of the faithfuls they become more sincere in their worshiping or their prayer life only when we face challenges or when we only when we are struck with certain uh, calamities or uh, sickness or illness and yes that is true and uh, so i have mentioned earlier in my presentation also that many of the christians we uh, we do not take our faith seriously and at the same time uh, we also uh, do not really put into practice what we believe or what we have learned and so uh, 
those are some of the important things that I would like to point out that uh, the practice of our faith, putting into practice what we uh, read from the Bible or what we hear from the preaching or from the teachings or what we learn here is important to put into practice, which is not just wait for the time where we have to undergo a pain or suffering or when we are struck with uh, calamities or suffering and, and such, but at all times we have to be uh, close to God. Of course, uh, we cannot also deny that uh, difficult times and sickness is also an opportunity for many of us to get closer to God. However, that that should need not that should not be the routine of our life, or that that is that we should be waiting for. But uh, it may be, uh, Mr. Barik has also mentioned about the family uh, altar. Even if we do not go out and uh, worship with others or meet others, the family altar is a, is also the best place where we can fare well in our spiritual journey. And at the same time, it's not only about, of course, it includes both the individual and also the collective uh, uh, aspect there. It starts with our individual uh, spiritual journey, how we fare well in our, uh, do well in our spiritual journey, and that will automatically lead to the Yeah, Brazil. Afan is already hanging, no? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for the question. And Dr. Akani has already pointed out so many things. And that is the sad and sad, sad part of our Christian life. Until and unless we are challenged, we are faced, uh, we are in trouble, we we often. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm saying I'm saying we, but it is very true and very practical. We when until unless we don't have sickness or troubles or difficulties in our life, we take our Christian faith and Christian life very lightly. But the time, the moment when we are faced with challenges with difficulties, sickness, we, that is our human nature, human behavior, which we are not supposed to be, but uh, yeah, that is the practical thing. It has also seen in the life during this uh, pandemic, I, I have been visiting to the churches as I'm working with the convention level, and then I have to go to many churches. Uh, the the previous question which was asked that how youths also can be used in the churches, I would like to respond in one line that uh, let the church even give responsibility to the youth, maybe as an assistant to the uh, secretary or different post, that is, that is the one of the answers to uh, which was asked to Mem Akani. Dr. Akani, regarding how youth can be involved. What I have seen now as I'm visiting many churches, many youths are taking responsibilities in different uh, areas, in particularly in mission. And they are going out in doing solidarity, in giving relief in different types of outdoor program, oriented program. So that is one thing. And of course, this, uh, until unless we are not challenged, we are not faced, we are very, uh, normal type of Christians, but yeah, again, when we are face challenge, tribal uh, trials, temptations, and then we become serious. And of course, um, this pandemic, this pandemic has really brought people uh, united from different uh, areas of their lives, forgetting everything with the fear, forgetting everything, and coming closer to God no matter what is the situation and circumstances, but coming closer to God is the most important thing, I, I, I believe. And that is the mission which Christ came to save us. That is the mission I should say. Uh, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. That's nice. 
Okay. Uh, we still have some uh, questions and some are, the, of course, uh, very good comments they are giving or supplements, we can say. But one is, uh, again, another is from... Uh, Uh, Philip Nam Konyak. I also want to ask one question regarding the effect of uh, COVID-19 in the church due to band of mass gathering in the church last year. Many people judge us as we are lack of faith and not to be trusted as the servant of God, saying we fall into trap uh, uh, of evil Can you just continue? It's uh, my this one is shaking because of the. By banning church mass gathering. Yeah, please uh, continue to respond to this. It's uh, I'm having a little problem here. Uh, Ma'am, do you want me to read the question? Yeah, okay, please. Uh, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, from the beginning, I also want to ask one question regarding the effect of post-COVID-19 in the church. Due to bond of mass gathering in the church last year, many people judge us as we are lack of faith and not to be trusted as the servant of God, saying we fall into the trap of evil by banning church mass gathering. And this year, I can also see the congregation's member reducing. How are we going to handle these people? And I'm serving as a pastor, and I'm, saving, and I'm facing the problem with my church members. And other pastors in my church are also facing the same problem. Please, I need intellectual and biblical, and biblical response to this. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for the question and for this uh, time, I would also, uh, it's a kind of repetition, but I again say that uh, when we say uh, church, ecclesia, or people of God, it is uh, not just gathering in a church building. And I think uh, many of our uh, believers or our church members they feel that uh, only when we go to the church when only when we gather together and worship together in a church then that is how uh, we become a church or we become an ecclesia but i think we should also educate our, our, our uh, tell our members or our believers that when we say church or ecclesia or people of god is not it is not of course that is also a uh, uh, corporate worship, community or communal worship is also a part of our Christian uh, faith and belief. However, uh, it is not just coming together in the church and worshiping uh, is uh, how we become an ecclesia or a church. It may be in the church coming together that is also a part of it. However, in our family or as people responding to God's call and responding to God's will through different uh, ways. For example, like during the time of pandemic, praying for one another and also doing some kind of relief work to others, reaching out to others, giving them hope. All those uh, are part of being an ecclesia or uh, are part of being uh, called the people of God. And uh, of course, uh, as I said, many of us are still in that uh, belief or in that definition of an ecclesia or a church that it is only when we gather together in a church building that uh, we can say that we are going spiritually or we are uh, our faith is being practiced however i think we should also dispel such kind of beliefs and give new ways of uh, new ways and means of aligning ourselves with god through various ways Okay, straight away to again MT Maxang uh, questions to Dr. Kanye. 
Amen. So if the church was in the Old Testament, then the rapture is for Old Testament church or for the New Testament church. Because Paul said rapture was not revealed in the Old Testament. Okay, thank you for uh, the time. And uh, in the Ecclesia in the New Testament, we have the, uh, in the Old Testament, Ecclesia, when we say Ecclesia, it is from the idea of Kahal, the assembly or the congregation of the people of Israel to listen to God, to hear the word of God, and also for uh, deciding matters uh, relating to their life. But here in the New Testament, it is uh, the Ecclesia now is, God's Israel. When we say uh, the church or ecclesia, it is God's Israel. It is the sense, the chosen ones, the elect race, the royal priesthood, a nation that belongs to God. All those are the uh, concepts which are from the uh, Old Testament. And so the concept of the people of God continues in the Old, uh, in the New Testament. When we say uh, ecclesia, it is uh, the people of God, the same people of God who continues uh, the people, the Israelite, the, who were called as the people of God. And now even in the New Testament, the Christians, the believers. And so uh, I would say that the rapture is for the Old Testament church or it is for the New Testament church. But it is uh, for me, I'm taking the people of God, the Ecclesia as the whole people of God. And so uh, for me, I'm not uh, saying it's the Old Testament church or the New Testament church, but the idea of Ecclesia or the idea that Ecclesia is the people of God, the whole people of God. I think we have uh, answered uh, most of the questions. Some are just uh, simply the comments. And what I like is from the Peter, according to me, our house should take the place of the church um, the place of the church in terms of band. My house should be uh, the, the, the group of people to gather to play to pray and worship or by worshiping just between three or two five people only and then the, dr what also has uh, given the good comments the COVID is challenging us oh, i just i just keep the comment that's all no need okay i think the rest is just uh, simply the comments so whoever is watching maybe they can read by themselves so is there anyone the to have a particular or specific uh, or the brief questions or the supplements that has to be made. Any word from Dr. Wadi or maybe Madam Limala? Hello, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Yes. Uh, I have I'm coming in the chat box. So, what we should do if we are exposed to coronavirus as a Christian? In the comment box, I have I have I have given you. Can you please read it? What should we do if we are exposed to coronavirus? Okay. Uh, what? We should do if you are exposed to coronavirus. Yes, uh, there are certain SOPs to follow, which are given from the government side and also from the medical side. And as Christians, uh, we have to seek God. And that is what I mentioned in our in my presentation to seek God because uh, ultimately God is our healer. And so I think uh, keeping in mind all the SOPs or the things that we have to do when we are exposed. Keeping in mind, as a Christian, I should say that we should seek God and also uh, be Hello. strong in our faith and have the hope that God is our healer. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody speaking? Okay, now I'd like to give time to Dr. Wati if there is anything to be uh, uh, 
made an announcement or any informations to be given? But uh, as I have already told you, we are ready with one book, which I, I have already shown some of you. Let me show you. Yeah, next, next week we are planning to release this book. And then how to get it, I will let you know next Friday. And then uh, we will have, uh, you know, two more speakers. And then we'll finish our module three. This is module five book. And then uh, four more books will be coming. And then I'm sure we all will have an opportunity to read the books. Thank you so much, uh, Jack Me and all the two speakers for your insightful presentation. Thank you. Okay, um, I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, sorry, Dr. Akani and Mr. Brazil for the very good uh, presentations. And the same thing will be again uh, given in the book form. So we will just uh, wait uh, even for that when the, another uh, in upcoming volumes that it will be coming out or published. And then thank you for all the, the people, those who are eagerly uh, uh, listened and then given the supplements or the comments. And we all try to fight together even to uh, and then march forward together to even to see the more uh, and then the dangerous diseases that may come. But if we come closer uh, to God and if we come all together in unity, I hope and pray that these kind of sicknesses and the problems will never uh, uh, come again or will never discourage us even in the future. So in order to conclude our webinar, may I request uh, Dr. Limala to uh, say a word of prayer and with that we will end our uh, presentations. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we want to thank you once again for this time of learning and then reflecting, especially on the COVID-19 impact on different areas of life, mission, church, and also many other related issues. And as Lord, we are in the midst of this pandemic, particularly in India that the COVID-19 is resurging everywhere and this pandemic is becoming a very critical issue in our day-to-day -day life. Lord, we pray that you help us to overcome and also give us your healing power to heal from this disease. We also pray for the tonight's resource persons who have presented the different two topics. We want to thank you for their presentations and also the wisdom that you have given to them and through their presentations, everybody have been blessed. We want to thank you for everything. And as we dismiss from this place, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Limbala. And thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Akane. Good night. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night to everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night. Good night.